So now, Kathy is going to do a demonstration for us. This is fulfilling her scholarship that she got, um, and her and Ken went and they made nutcrackers. So here she is. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Can you hear me? I've been told I don't have a strong voice, so we're good. Okay, thank you. I have always been interested in the nutcrackers that come out at Christmas time. For example, this is a commercial nutcracker that one of my students gave me at one point in time. And I've always looked at them in the holidays and thought they were amazing to have such variety. However, a couple of years ago, I noticed that Craft Supply, which has the Dale Nish School of Wood Turning in Provo, had a class on wood nutcrackers. And so I thought, well, maybe sometime I'll do that. Then I became a wood turner. And so when the Ed Jones Scholarship was offered, I decided to apply for it because, well, for those of you who knew Ed, he always liked to learn new things to do with wood wanted a variety of things um, to learn and was always learning. So I thought, well, this isn't a bowl. This is something interesting. So I think Ed would have appreciated that I spent the money on something totally new. Um, I did, we did sign up for the class. I was glad Ken went with me because there were pages of notes there. We had a chart that we were given at the beginning of the week and I'll have Jerry focus on the chart for a second, we were handed the dimensions of a nutcracker. If it were that easy, that would be wonderful. However, it did take all five days of the class and a little extra one night to finish the nutcracker that we were making. Paul Anderson was the teacher of the class and Kirk Deheer was the assistant that week. So between both of them, I learned a lot about wood turning and making the nutcracker. Paul would give a really thorough demonstration before each part that we started. Today, I'm going to give you an overview of all of the steps that we went through, and it's a really short version. Um, we barely made it through the week with our nutcrackers completed, so, but we were all delighted, and the next week we were amazed we actually made it. The first thing that we were told in the class is to or asked in the class was to decide if we wanted to make a king or a soldier. Well, since I had a demonstration to do, do to do afterwards because of the scholarship, Ken decided to make a soldier. I made a king during the class, and then we bought kits to remake them, which we're in the middle of, so that I could do this demonstration. So we picked up a box. This is a king box for a future king that I'll make. And inside we have a lot of wood, a lot of parts, and they're hard to see in this box, but this was our little home for our nutcracker as we're pulling things out during the week. For example, this is the torso, and I will be starting with that in a minute, but I'm going to have Ken pull up a picture. It's easier to see what's in here on a picture that I have put together. So if I were to spread out the parts of a nutcracker from that box, this is what they would look like. Both the king and the soldier kits have almost the same things in it, except the hats are different on the two characters. The fur is actually mink that is used for the hair and the beard. And you'll notice on the lower left-hand corner that there's some vinyls. This was a wood turning class. It wasn't a paint and decorate your nutcracker class. So Paul and his wife had designed some vinyl um, stick on pieces that would make the decorative part of a nutcracker. If you go to the next slide, so this is the soldier one. The next slide shows the one that would be the king. Almost the same thing, the same parts, except that the crown and the hat will be different. I'm going to start with the same piece that we started with in the class, and that's making the torso as I give you an overview of the things that we were making. So on the next picture, you'll see that that square block that I had has been rounded because as wood turners, what's the first thing we have to do is round wood, correct? So here's a rounded torso. 
And in the next picture, you'll see that we have to mark the parts that are going to be turned. And if you if we start on the left hand side, that would be the shoulder, then the belt, and then the hip, the widest part of the hip. Those are the lines that will be on the torso. And I'll be talking about that a little, little bit more. I'm going to turn a bit of it so that you can see how it forms. The next picture will show the part that I'm going to be at right now on the lathe, and that the hip and the shoulder are exactly at the same diameter. The reason being that if you lay it on its side, it's easier to drill and things like that if they're the same diameter. So at this point, the lower hip and the shoulder have been marked at the same point and the belt, which is the deeper part, has been put to the level that it will need to be for the belt. So this is where we're starting. And I'm going to turn a little bit now so that you can see how it forms. Now, Dean already came up to me and said, you have long hair. Are you going to do anything about it? It's a safety issue. So yes, I'm going to pull my hair back. Thank you, Dean. And I'm also going to wear a face shield because it is turning. But I want to talk about a safety thing that occurs when using calipers. Calipers have always frightened me because I see people here and watch them float around. Um, and they never felt comfortable until I was in this class. I was told the best way to use calipers like this is to put it between your fingers so that you have a firm way to hold it. Use your thumb to hold the outside portion of it. And then make sure that your elbow is resting on your headstock area. This way you have full support when you're using the calipers. I am, this is most of the way turned down, but I want to demonstrate how to use it a little bit better so that it's safe. However, I don't feel comfortable about the square parts I left. So I'm going to use my spindle roughing gouge first to take a little bit off. So oh yes, I knew they're paying attention. I love it. <laughs> okay, if that's my first error, I'm good. I'm done. Okay, Let me watch my speed. Now, the, I like the spindle roughing gouge because it has more ability to do things than I used to think. All right, we're going to test it again. So I'm just going to take some of this off so that you can see where I'm going to be putting the calipers. And this will be turned down anyway with a spindle gouge in a little bit. So the important thing with the spindle roughing gouge is to follow the bevel, just like with all tools. And usually at about a 45 degree level. Okay, now you'll be able to see where I'm talking about. So with the, this is almost the dimension I want for the belt. Once again, I'm going to put this between my fingers using my thumb to support it. Put my elbow on the headstock. And then when you put the caliper down in this area, you want to only touch the front part closest to you, to the area. Don't put the other part down until you're ready to feel secure that it's in the right place. And then we can start cutting until the caliper goes through, which it's going through at this point in time. So that's the safety tip that I learned when I was in the class about how to safely use it. I'm going to use a spindle roughing gouge to take this part of the sh shoulder down. So one thing, um, I stopped Ken before the next slide, but at the end of the shoulder, I, I'll just take this out now that I know it's working right. I have already drawn the diameter of where the neck will be on the torso of the, of the nutcracker. So that line is already telling me how far I need to, to turn to bring the shoulder together. So now I'll put it back in. 
And thanks for fixing the headstock. If it walked off, I don't know what I would have done. Chased it. Chased it? <laughs> Jump. Jump? Yeah, I probably would have jumped far. Okay, so I'm going to use, I think this might be a five inch spindle gouge, but I don't know. I know which ones I like and I don't memorize those sizes. So I'm going to start with a shoulder. And as with anything, when you are using a tool, hold it securely with your hand in either way. Since I'm going to be cutting downward, I'm going to start at the edge and start shaping it. But I want to keep in mind where my low level of my neck is. So I'm going to just shape it. And with good tool, tool control, there won't be a lot of standing later. Now the torso, it's nice that we start with the torso because it's actually one of the easier pieces to make when making um, the nutcracker. I'm almost at the dimension I want. One more slight cut. Okay, so I now have a shoulder and I'm going to start working toward um, the other parts of the, 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 um, the chest of the torso. Now, one thing about taking the class we had so many things that we learned that it was constant knowledge. So it took a while till the second one came along to see the big picture. So now I know, which I didn't know when I made my first one, this part of the torso needs to be fairly flat so that when the arms are attached, they can move freely in it. If it's angled too much where the arms are attached, you, the arms may not fall to the level that they need to be. So I'm going to keep that fairly flat. As I work toward the belt area. And usually I don't have people watching me turn. So thank you for being patient with me. Now I've had the opportunity to make a few torsos for several reasons. When I started the class, the first torso that I was given, the blank, actually had some embedded bark and some insect holes in it that we weren't aware of until I started turning it. So I'll pass that around in a little bit. One of the th things that Paul told me is that you want to make sure when you are choosing wood for a torso or any other object on a nutcracker that this is an art piece so you want to make sure that your quality of wood is good when you're making it it's his kits come with the larger blocks a lot of people will glue two blocks together because the thinner wood is easier to find um, but his kit actually has the bigger pieces and i'll talk about how we work from this to making the slot that would hold the jaw from the other direction, I'll start. The hips also are left. I don't think I sharpened this as happily as I like it. Um, this part is also kept fairly flat, this part of the hip. And it's partly because your waist is coming out. It's just part of the design of the nutcracker. So this gives an idea of how this part is made. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. You can see how I am working through the shaping of it, but there's a lot of a nutcracker that I want to explain to you. So I think I will stop here, but I did want to talk about how to use calipers and what tool is used. The spindle gouge is used most of the time in making this because most of the pieces are spindles. Not, not all of them, but some are. So this is a torso I will finish later for another king I'm working on, but I wanted to give you the idea of how it's made. So Ken, would you go ahead and return to the pictures for now? Let me take this. So this is where I started a minute ago with my torso. 
and that's the line. Now, in this particular one, there were two lines, and that's because I had to remake a torso because of a problem, and then I was fitting it to the head. So there's actually two lines, an outer one, so I didn't go too far, and then an area so that I knew how big the head would be. I just wanted to have that buffer so that I didn't have to remake the head also. So that's why there's two lines on this one. So this would be the finished part if I had gone farther, um, which takes a little more time. So I wanted to do it when I have, oh, I can take that away for a minute. Okay, thanks. Okay, so at this point, that's what the torso would look like. And then on the next picture, I'll talk about how we mark it to make the slot. There's a slot where the jaw goes, I'll just grab a nutcracker. So on the torso, there's a slot so that the jaw can actually go in. This is one that was actually made at that. This is actually my king that I made. So the slot has to be put in place for the jaw. And I'll put this out again later. So in order to mark that from the center, you have to decide what's the best look for your torso, what direction do you want, Push, put the arrow there, and then the outer lines show how wide that particular uh, slot will be when you need it for the jaw. So this is these are the cutting lines. When we were in cl class, the next slide will show how this is put on a jig. When we were in class, Paul Anderson did all the cutting on the table saw. We were authorized to use the lathes, but not the table saws. But for those of us who are going to make a ginger, gingerbread, a nutcracker again at home, we were taught how to make the jigs and how to do the cuts. So this is the jig that was used. You can see the arrow pointing, which would be the front of the nutcracker, and then the lines that will be sawn. And the next picture shows the setup on our saw. So this is how the slot would actually be cut. It's a little complicated, but we did learn to do it. However, in it does, it's not an easy adjustment. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So this is the way that that is actually put together. And I think I'll stop on that for a second. So I have several torsos. For example, in one case, and I'll just put them here. I'm going to pass these around so you can get a closer look at them. But this one that has bu bugs and bark inclusion, this was one that would not make a good nutcracker because of the inclusion. It's an art piece. It's not something that it would be artistically enhanced by having those on them. Also, I just talked about cutting the slot. So I bought Ken a new saw and we were learning, he was learning how to use it. And one problem was that, you can go ahead and start passing that one. One problem was that when we set up the saw for the cuts, you have to put a stop block so that it doesn't saw all the way through. And it keeps the angle of the nutcracker. So in this particular case, it went too far. The line should be here. And I'm going to pass this together with the one that I'm currently making that is correct. Because if you do not stop the saw at a certain point, you don't get the arc that is needed for the jaw. Kathy, I put a, the picture back up. Okay. So you can show the stop block right yeah, there. Yes, so the stop block. So in order to use the jig, you push it far enough forward to get to a line that you put on your nutcracker torso, and you have to stop at that point. However, the you have to twist to turn off this saw, and Ken kind of twisted as he was pushing further, so it cut a little bit further. So setting that up is part of what the issue was but this will you can compare and see what the arc is like the one that says Sol soldier is the on the bottom is one i'm currently making so as i pass things around i just want to talk about passing manners this has already been sanded and please don't drop it on the floor or other things because it's going to progress to being a nutcracker so 
if you'll just treat them with care, we both appreciate it because these are things we've spent about two weeks getting ready. So I'll go ahead and pass these around. And also, if you want to be excited and tell your neighbor something, I appreciate it if you only whisper, keep it quiet. I have a lot to show you and I want to keep going. Are there any questions so far with the torso? Okay, I will continue then. So the next piece that we made is the head that goes on top of the torso. And um, go ahead, Ken, and show the, let me, sh let me show you what the head looks like first and I'll pass these around later. I wanna talk about it first. The head itself, I'll put it here for Jerry's benefit. You'll notice that there's a different angle on these two heads. The picture I'll show you in a minute shows that there's a dimension to the head where you want four inches toward the nose area so that you have a curve to the head. This particular one that I made recently does have that curve. This one does not. The head is too flat. The piece that I was given to make it out of was actually not a circle. He pre-cuts it somewhat, but it had some angles to it so that in rounding it, I rounded too far to maintain that four inches. So one thing I learned quickly in the class, if you have a piece and you need to round it, you round it gingerly. So that was one of my learnings about that. So if you go to the pictures, can now show what that looks like. Sorry, there will be a lot of pictures, but that was the best way to explain such a complex project. When we were making the ones recently, we stopped to take a lot of pictures because it's easier to see rather than just have it described. So this is a circle guide and you can see that the four inch is very close on some parts of it. This is before it was rounded. So there wasn't much leeway to round it down and keep and maintain that four inches. Next, you'll see that we have to measure it. On the diagram, it tells a recommended dimension for the neck but it's important to check your torso, which is at the bottom, to make sure what your actual measurement is so that that neck will fit correctly when you put the two together. So the, the head is actually attached on a face plate. You'll go next with double-sided tape. Double-sided tape became a, became a really good friend during this project. I don't want extra holes in the, in the head because I want to make sure that when it's put together later, everything will be centered. So the double-sided tape holds the, uh, the head blank in place. If you'll go to the next one with the center finder, helps get it centered. And then it will be put on, on the lathe. Go ahead and keep going. With the tail stock up just for support because the double sided tape, it does that craft supply has holds really well, but you don't want that flying off when you're turning it. So then it's turned with a spindle gouge. This is the actual shape of the one that I'm going to be passing around. The, the nice thing about having the double sided tape is that you can then put the torso up against the head and check to make sure the neck size is correct. So this is a check before you take it off the lathe and then it's a final check when you are able to stand it up in the next slide. So once you stand it up, you can actually feel around the neck and make sure that it is a good fit. There's only one more step in the head and that is actually done later. The screws that go into the head and attach it to the torso are countersunk. And so this is just the process that we're doing at this point. Okay, I'm going to pass these two heads and I've already talked a little bit about how one is too flat. So you can just compare the difference in the two. Thank you, Mark. And I have notes because there's so many slides and we had to adjust how I was doing this last night. 
I want to talk about the arms. The arms were next. Now, this is all the first day of class. We've made a torso, we've made a head, and now we have to make arms. So the first day of class is filled with getting to know what the project is, demonstrations on how to make each thing, and then to progress. So for the arms, we have, go ahead with pictures. I'm going to go through it, but then I'm going to stop and turn a little bit in the middle again. So we're given a blank, a long bl rectangular blank for the arms. And the arms, as you know, you have two on your body and they need to match. So here's our first blank. And as wood turners, once again, we need to turn it to, to round it. And then in the next slide, you'll see markings. There were a few markings on the torso. However, on the arm, we have a lot more parts. We have the upper arm, which is kind of a sleeve, like your shoulder area, which is on the left. The next mark is like the cap of the sleeve. Like if you had short sleeves on and that's that cutting port portion of the sleeve, the middle mark is where the elbow would be. The next one would be the bottom of your sleeve and the far right one is the end of your hand. Now you'll see that in the next few slides as, it's, as it gets shaped. So go ahead to the next. Now this is a close up of the hand end of the, of the turned arm. The, on the left is the elbow area. And on the right, you'll see where the arrow is. This is the sleeve. So that's already been turned down to the size of the sleeve. And I've started making the hand. The hand will go to the size of the black line, but it's angled. It looks like a big teardrop or a big um, raindrop. So go ahead to the next one. This is further on the development of the arm. You can see most of the sleeve part of the top has been finished. And this is where I'm gonna stop for a second and talk about how the arm is formed a little bit more so you can see it from a turning point of view. My hand, okay. I like working so that my hand is toward the tail stock. It just makes it easier to, for me to visualize so that the arm is this direction. And of course I have to, right. this is made with a spindle gouge again. Um, sometimes if there's a lot of material, I use a spindle roughing gouge to get started with it. But I'm going to show you the shaping of the hand a little bit. So in this particular case, this is the, the hand area. We've got the elbow height. This is the start, this line is the start of the angle of the top of the sh shoulder. So grab this gouge. It's not as sharp as I like. Okay, I always like to check and make sure that the, the tool rest is in about the right place. Turning this on its side and pointing at it is helpful. And we will go to work on the hand a little bit so you can see how that's shaped. Actually here, I'll go down to the sleeve. When you're tur spindle turning, you want to get close to the area where you're working and then work backwards from it. And because you, I'm a really slow turner, but since it's a demo, I'm trying to be a little quicker than normal. Because this will be replicated for the other arm, you spend a little more time on shaping the first arm because that provides the pattern for the other arm that you're gonna be making. Okay, since I'm gonna work on the hand, I'll start from this direction. And actually, I'm gonna use my roughing gouge again just to take a little more material off. just to make it a little bit quicker. Even though this is a really big tool, it looks really big, it actually can be focused into small areas and I appreciate that.
Okay, to form the hand, we're going to go down to the to the, I think it's one inch area for the wrist. And with, with this particular task, you take it, like I say, slowly so that you can get the dimension and the shapes that you want to get. And the cleaner you are with your cuts, of course, the less sanding you have to do, which is always a bonus, I think. I did discover I had a favorite sandpaper that I bought at Craft Supply because it doesn't leave marks like some of the other sandpapers. I don't remember the name of it though. It starts, it's not like Fiskars, but it does start with an F. So in forming the round for the, need to take some of this off too so I can get down there. So in forming the round for the hand, you take your time, but follow your bevel as you're turning. And the difficult part is when you have your other hand and you are trying to duplicate it. However, a benefit for the arms is that they're on opposite sides of the body. So they don't have to be absolutely perfect. And as you pass those back, Carolyn is collecting those for me in the back. One of the things that I've been told over and over is use finesse. Take your time until you get a shape that you're happy with. And this is close to a hand on a close demo, on a quick demo that I would do. Um, so I would go back and forth in the center, take that, take that divot out. But this is this would be how the hand is made. You'll do the same thing, of course, in the shoulder. Is start turning it back until you get the the sh so the shoulder. I keep wanting to say soldier because it's a soldier. The shoulder to the shape that you want to have. This is the elbow. It's going to be a little bit wider than the sleeve, of course. So this will go back and forth. You go back and forth until you get the shape that you're ready to accept as the, as the arm. So this is the technique for making the arm. And that's the only other thing I'm going to be turning right now. So I can take that off. If, if after you've turned it, you're not happy with and you don't want to do as much sanding, one of the things that you can do is you can use a negative rake scraper and go along and kind of smooth it out to reduce the amount of sanding that you need to do. But in general, if you have good cuts, you don't have to do as much sanding. So we'll go back to the pictures. Ken. May I suggest that Jerry look at the diagram? Point to the diagram, oh. kind of show what you've just turned as the arm. What's your okay. object? Okay, so, so at this point, I'm working on the hand portion. This is the top of the sh 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 shoulder. And then this will be the cap of that portion of it. And then I'm work would be working on the the bottom of the sleeve. So Thank you for mentioning that. So this will continue. I'm a slow turner. This could be another half hour for me. And there's more pieces to tell you about. So from here, we'll go back to the pictures for a bit here. OK, so this is the one that we saw a minute ago. I've already shaped the hand at this point. So this would be a picture of the final arm that would be made. Now. Once you have it made, you keep the ends on for the simple reason that you have to replicate it. And if the other one ends up being a little smaller, you may have to return this back to the lathe and adjust until you get them to about the same size. So go ahead to the next one. This is the step that you'll take with the next one. When you're replicating, 
you don't want to necessarily go by the diagrams on the measurements on the diagram anymore because you want to match it to the arm that you are going to be replicating. So at this point, I would start using calipers to measure. And so the next, this shows the completed arms. Now I'm gonna have Ken keep that there for just a second because your eye plays tricks on you. If you look at the top of the two shoulders, they, you have the grain to look at. I'm measuring to see if it looks right. But in the case of the ones I'm gonna pass around for a second, I'm off by a little bit because my eye was tricking me. One thing I should have done is, and I'll show that in a minute so that you can see it, is to use a straight edge to make sure that everything was lined up correctly. But it's a handmade object, so it isn't good to necessarily be perfect. Next. After, the arms are made, the left arm on a nutcracker generally is holding, is holding something in its hand. So for example, a king would have a scepter, went to the bandsaw to set it up. And then we were both really nervous because this was done by Paul in class. So we found a rolling pin and marked it up in different ways so that we could practice. So anytime we've learned big lesson in this is you only have one set of parts in the kit. You don't want to make a mistake. So it's better to practice than it is to actually make the cut and make a mistake. So we practiced. And then in the next slide, it was time to be brave and actually cut it. So this is the cut started and then the cut ended. So now we've done wonderful work putting this together. And now will it even work? And then it's glue. we do turn it, and I'll show you that in a second. And then glued with, um, um, it's just wood, wood glue, tight bond. bond. Yeah, tight bond. These are also marked for drilling. You can see those little plus marks. And in one more of the arm slides, the last step would be drilling them. Because the left arm is bent, it's also canted a little bit. So it's not drilled at the same angle that the other one is. It needs to be turned a little bit. So I'm going to pass around some arms. And I wanna show, before I pass around, here's our rolling pin. So the rolling pin cut, was like this, can you see that? Before we turned it, once it was cut, you turn it and that's how you make the angle of your arm. So you'll see, I'll go ahead and pass this also with the arms and you can see the completed arms for my soldier in addition to playing with this and see how it helps to have a model. Okay, so I'll pass these around. Any questions so far? Okay, I will continue with the legs. The next thing that we had to make, oh, before I continue. So the first day we made the torso, we made the two arms and we made the head. Well, most of us had the arms done. The class starts at eight. Most of us were there at 7.30 rapidly finishing our arms because the next day we had to start our legs. So once again, we'll turn to the pictures again for a second. They, we have a blank, which we have to round and it's, labeled nicely so we know that this one's the leg so the leg is rounded and now we have to mark the leg a little bit different differently it has a tenon tenon on both ends and i'll be showing that in a little bit it, you'll notice it's marked by the tenon the top of the thigh which is going ag against the torso where the knee would be, where the boot is, the bottom of the foot, which will be against the base, and then a tenon on the bottom. So this particular part of the, this is the sturdy part of the nutcracker and the tenons are what hold us in place. So the next, so one thing that's a key because it's the legs of the nutcracker is that it has to sit evenly on both sides on the base. So I'll put this up here for a second. Okay, Jerry. Okay. It has to sit evenly on the base. So even though 
you want to replicate everything the best you can. With the legs, you want to replicate them like they're twins, identical twins, because otherwise your nutcracker is going to sit crookedly. At each one of them are exactly five inches long. And that's why I was showing the measure there. It has to be exactly five inches from the top of the thigh to the base in order for them to set equally. Or it could be five and a quarter, depending on the height of your nutcracker, but they have to be even on both sides. So go ahead. So you have to be meticulous with this particular one. The calf, go ahead back to the pictures. The calf and the thigh are the same size on the nutcracker. So they're both one and a half inches. Go ahead to the next one. So in this particular case, I'm pointing with the arrows where those two areas have been um, cut down to show that those are at one and a half inches. The foot actually is at about one inch when it's finished, but I just have started with that on the picture here. The next one will show something that we used in the class and I'll be passing this around with the legs I'm going to pass so you can play with it. The nutcracker gauge was very helpful to help us know how far those particular um, legs, tenons were to, to be made for the three quarter inch diameter. Because of the way the wood is, it had to be tapered so that that fit in there. But this gauge gave us a chance to see approximately the size. However, on the next slide, you have to be able to fit it inside or it's not consistent for the whole tenon. So it was a guide, but now it's checking for accuracy. And in the next slide, it shows it has to be flush. So against the foot, it has to be flush so it will be on the base. So notice the foot is on this side. And in the next slide, I had to turn it around. Part of the process is turning it around because we can only turn the tenons from the tailstock area, partly because you hold it up and then slip the gauge or across it and you have to keep testing it. So it's held, you're kind of holding it on the headstock, on your, on your center, testing, testing. There's a lot of testing when making a nutcracker. So, and you can see on the left-hand side by the spur drive that it is tapered down so that you can move the gauge up onto the tenon. Okay, next one. The gauge also had a one, has a one inch diameter to help with making the ankles. When we're putting the toes on the nutcracker, those are one inch. So we had to have that matched too. So this was a gauge to help with that. The next picture shows the finished leg. In this case, the lines are the edges of the tenons. The line part way down that you can barely see there, but you'll see when I pass the leg around was made by a skew and that's the top of the boot. So this is the first leg made. Then we work on the second leg. The measurement that's most key is the five inches, which is the size of this particular nutcracker. And so all the markings relate to the first one. And it's important to use calipers and check over and over to make sure it's right because those are the parts that are right next to each other. So the next one, once it's finished, you cut them at the length of the tenon and then you have your two legs. So this is what I'll be passing this time. And you're welcome to, um, just a second, to kind of play with it because I trust you not to drop it, but I want you to check. This is, if you have a gauge like this, it's very helpful in the end, but it isn't consistent unless it will actually go in the hole like it will for the drilled hole that will be in the base or in the torso. Okay, so I'll pass that around. Thank you. And we'll continue because there's so many parts. Any questions on the legs at all? After making the legs, we finally had time to make something sort of easy and that's the base. So the base is, um, in my case, I have a hickory one, I've had a cherry one, and also maple makes a good base. So the, some of the, those are some of the woods that we have. So 
on the picture, I'll show you how it was attached to the lathe. We used a woodworm screw. This is the, you'll notice that the base is not round. Remember how I was talking about rounding earlier? You want to make sure to get it as round as you can. In this case, if I round it a lot, I'm going to lose a lot of my base size. So um, that's just something to notice on here. So we drilled a hole to put the wormwood, the woodworm screw in, such a confusing one, with a spacer. You can go to the next one. This particular case, the spacer was tight on most of the way around, but there was a little gap on one side. It was as close as we could get it down. Luckily, Ken was helping me get it on as tightly as possible, but I was hoping I could turn it, round it, and make it nice anyway without that gap. So I rounded it and was able to do pretty well on the outside diameter. However, because of that little gap, it lifted one side. So in making the cove along the top edge, it was thicker on one side than the other. The only solution at that point in time was to start over and I didn't wanna do that. So we took the cold jaws out and put very short rubber bumpers on it so that I could carefully get in with a spindle gouge and clean that cove up. So as I pass it around, you can see it's fairly clean, I think. And then at this point, it's a finished base. And I'll go ahead and pass that around. The base that I'm passing around does have the holes in it. If you had the legs still, then you could test it, but they do mark, do, they do match. It is a three quarter inch hole for both of them. Later on, I'll talk about the, well, I'll go ahead and talk about it right now. These are actually back a little bit because they're not centered because the toes are going to be on one side sticking out. So you don't want it in the center or the toes would be sticking out too far. So that's the base. That was one of the easier parts to make. In fact, I'll show you on here. I'll just grab this one. So if you look at the base, the toes go forward. And so you don't want them in the center. You need room for the toes to be on the base. This is a, the most complicated project I've ever made in my whole life. And it has so many parts. So let's move on to the next thing. Um, in class, we started doing drilling and things, but at home we decided let's make all the parts that we could. So then we went smaller. It was time to make the feet. This is once again, looks bigger than it is. It's the same size in the picture as the others, but it's actually a small piece of wood. And then of course we have to round it. In rounding mine, I love it. I always like to see what's inside the wood and here I had a duck. So that was exciting to see the shape that came out of it. But that duck actually is helpful because now I can just describe to you how small it actually is. So against the leg itself, which is the start of the beak of the duck, it's only going to be one and one sixteenth inch diameter. So that part's very small. The finished toe is only going to be one inch long. So even though it looks big on the screen, when I pass the feet around, you'll see how small they actually became. So on the next one, of course, you have to replicate it because you have two feet. And in this case, I've marked the high spot and the low spot so that I know what my guide is for making the second foot. And you'll notice that we kept the flats on the end of the wood. And part of that reason is for the next process where we're going to be cutting it. So here's the two feet that have been started ready for cutting. And we're back to the table saw. So in this case, we're going to be cutting it so that we have the flat of the foot. When it's cut, that little foot is only seven eighths of an inch high. So that's why we wanted to keep the ends on so we had something to hold on to when we're cutting it. So this is cut and then you can see how it's cut to that seven eighths inch part for the high part of that toe. After that we had to get a bore bit 
Now, Paul had a bore bit and he said, this is the best way to do it. It's the smoothest cut. And this bore bit never is not made anymore. It's a Stanley bore bit. So Ken learned how to do an auction on eBay. And so we have a bore bit. If anyone ever needs to use it, they can come visit our house. But it does make a smooth cut. So in the next slide, it cuts most of the way through. That's one inch. It's one and one sixteenth inch. So there's a little bit of wood left that needs to be cut off. We sawed that off. And so it's in these pieces and then it's sanding time. So I'm going to pass around the feet. So Jerry, so you can show people at home on Zoom. These are the finished feet and they have been sanded. You'll see that the bore cut is fairly smooth on it. So I don't want them to walk away. So they're in a little container. Thank you. Any questions on the feet? Okay. So a few months ago or a few weeks ago, I'm, I don't remember when Bruce Butler decided to do a chips and grits on the biggest thing you've made and the smallest thing you've made. The smallest thing I've ever made is the nose of a nutcracker. So the nutcracker has, is it still on me? The nutcracker has a very small little nose. Both of these have where Jerry is this good right here? I know, I know. So you can see the shape of the nose. It's sort of like a, the bell of a trumpet or a Hershey's kiss or uh, something like that with a flat edge. So these are both of the ones that we made and that little nose is very small. So in class, there were a lot of noses dropping on the floor. You can well imagine. So that gives an example of how small it is. So in order to make it, we actually put the blank. Go ahead to the pictures, please. We actually put the blank on a check with 25 millimeter jaws in order to hold the little rectangle. So this is the nose on the jaws, barely held there. And then we're turning the little trumpet or bell shape at the end. This actually is only going to be five eighths of an inch high. So that's why it's the smallest thing I've ever made. Once it's turned, then we used a Dremel to smooth the back because it has to fit against the face. So the Dremel with the sander is really good for turning that part, not only on the nose part, but on the support part because that's the part we're going to hold against the face to get it to fit the face correctly. So this has been sanded back. Now to fit the nose on a face, double-sided tape comes into play again. So we put double-sided tape on the center where the nose is actually going to be located and then put sandpaper on top of that double-sided tape. The little handle that we've left on the nose helps scrape it back and forth until you get the fit that you need on your face. And you can bring it over next to the sandpaper and check it, check it. Everything in making Nutcracker is checking again. Actually, there's two noses in here. They're in a baggie. I really didn't want to look for them on the floor, and I don't think you do either. So there, there's a nose that I've made and that Ken has made for the next nutcrackers that we're making. And you'll be able to see the size of the wood that we're using, just a small little thing. So that's my smallest thing, Bruce, just so you know. Thank you. So then it's time to go bigger, but do you want like a seven, we're getting there, but does anybody wanna stretch for one minute because you've been sitting a long time? If so, Feel free to st stretch. Nope, no takers. Okay, we'll keep going. So we had the little tiny thing made and then about Wednesday, it was time to start working on the hats for the, for the nutcrackers. The first time I made a king, this time Ken's making a king. So we're going to talk about the crown first, which is what he is making so that I could take pictures. So on the next picture, we put 
the crown piece on a wood worm screw on the lathe. And this time we don't have to worry about the depth, so there's no spacers. And then I want to talk about this line that he marked. So the line that he marked is the line where the beads will be. So I'll show the king a little bit later, a little more, but there are beads at the top of the crown. I'll show that in a little bit again. Now, when Paul was teaching, there is so much that we're watching and thinking about as we're making things at a fairly high speed in the class. And he really focused on the beads because there's two beads, there's a cove in the middle with um, some decor that goes in between pinstriping. So he focused on the beads. So I went back to my lathe already to get busy and promptly forgot that the top of the crown has a larger diameter than the beading area. So I had it turned down to the size for the beads and there went my blank. Luckily, I was in a class and he had extras because Kirk to here walked up behind me asking, so what are you doing? I think that's a pretty small crown and it would have been. I'll show you that in a little bit too. So Ken almost did the same thing. The beads are such a focus that you have to be careful that you need to remember to start with the largest dimension. So near the tail stock where the sorby center is, that's actually the width of the outside of the crown. The inside will be where the beads are. That will be smaller. Here he's measuring with the calipers and the parting tool, the dimension that will go on top of the head. So it's slightly larger than the head itself. So it sticks over a little bit. So that would have needed to be sanded. So the next thing that he proceeded to do is start making the beads. We have an Ashley Isles beading tool, and that's what he's using here to make the bottom bead of the crown. And then the next to that is a cove, a flat cove where the pin striping will be. And then the next slide will show the second bead that he's made. So the second bead is in this area, the pin striping will be in the middle as a decoration for the crown. And notice how he stepped it down so that he can get the beading tool into the position to make the bead. At this point, he'll continue turning it just like you would a bowl to turn the outside of the crown. And the top is wider, which is what it should be. At this point, we'll treat it like a bowl and start hollowing out the inside. It is, I believe, an eighth inch thick. Okay, it isn't one eighth inch thick bowl side, whatever that word is. Um, it's wall of the bowl, yes. And in this case, we're going to be putting a dome on it. So he's using a box cutter to make a flat to put the dome on later. So this was the crown being made. And so the crown is made ready to do some indexing. There are six uh, arcs on the top of the, uh, or peaks on the top of the crown. And these have to be indexed. So they're equally, six of them equally around. So Phil Brown taught Ken how to index with the, these particular tools when they're making the basket illusion projects and this is what he uses he's familiar with it so he used that instead of using the lathe to mark the six places for making those peaks so the next slide shows how we make them we had to get a drum sander that we could put on the drill press and the crown is put into it between points and between those points until you've made the arcs so that's this point in the next slide will show once it's finished, this is what it would look like. The, they are downward, sanded downward toward the inside of the crown. So you just have to be careful in sanding to do that. One advantage to us doing different things is we were able to help each other know what to do when we came home because I had made this and he hadn't. And we each had about 45 pages of notes to remember all this. So next one, it's time to make the dome to put inside. Now the dome is also mounted on the woodworm screw. 
And once again, you have a, a round and you have to round it and you don't know what the actual diameter will be until you have it rounded. His is finished in this, at this point in this picture. One thing that I came to a realization of while watching him do this is next time I will make the dome first. And the reason I would do that is because the dome dimension, the outer diameter, and you can, the outer diameter, like in this picture, can change depending on the depth of the crown. So as you're angling down, you may find a better fit if you're a little bit deeper or not. Mine went a little bit deeper than his, mine fits in a little differently. So from now on, when I make a king, I'm making the dome first because they're both on that screw and you can test the dome, you can't test the crown. So I'm gonna change the order in the future. So we'll stop there. And oh, one last picture is that we will, we do attach it with dowels. So holes are drilled, from the head to the crown and the dome, all in the center. And that's how it will be attached. So I'm gonna pass the crown around. So this is the crown that Ken has made, and Jerry, so I'll put you over here. So when you're looking at the crown that he's made, you'll notice that in his case, maybe if he'd made the dome first, the distance he would have made how far he would have gone down to put the rim might have changed. Mine's a little tighter, his is a little looser, but that was part of the learning process. This has a constant learning process to make a nutcracker because you're making so many things. So this is connected by a dowel right now. So um, just be careful because the tips are done. The dome will come out, it's not glued in place. Yeah, it's that's true. Any questions on the crown? Okay. All right. So then I'm making a soldier. Well, let me, before you change that, let me, I was going to show the finished part with the, with the uh, beads. There is pinstriping in the crown. And then these gems are actually added later. This is a wood turning class. It's not a decorating class. So the only painting we did was minor in this particular class, enough to finish the Nutcracker. But Paul and his wife have designed some of these decals so that it can go quicker. All of it's focusing on the wood turning portion. So the soldier hat. The soldier hat is also started on a woodworm screw. But before doing that, um, it had to be sanded on a disc sander for the simple reason that that portion of the hat is going to be glued to the grant to the brim, and you want to make sure that it's smooth so that you have a, a smooth tight adherence joint. to it. Tight joint. Tight tight joint. That's a good way to put it. So. You'll notice that this has to be rounded quite a bit. It's pretty square. But then after it's been rounded, then I marked with a cal caliper the outer dimension of the top of the hat. And then above that will be curved in for the top of the hat. So there's only a few things to mark on the hat, but that's one of them. And then inside the the diameter that will be fitting onto the brim. After that, it's just turned. This is the turned finish of the top of the hat. You can see the curvature to the top, and this has been sanded. I think this one is maple. Yes, this is a paintable maple. It looks nice after it's been painted. Some of the grains comes through, so it puts some dimension into the hat. So the next one, a little bit more challenging is to make the brim. The brim, once again, I had to have spacers. These actually work better than the first set did. There's two because it's shallow. It is actually making a platter. So nutcrackers take a lot of skills. This is a picture of the setup for the brim before it's all turned. In the center part, the bottom of the top of the hat will be sitting in this area. 
And then there's a 1 16th inch rim on the outside of that that actually becomes an accent on the hat. So that's marked. I've, I've started just turning down a little bit with a bowl gouge for the angle, just so I had that marked. And then on the left is another mark. This is only 1 8 inch thick. So that's the outer bottom part of the brim. So that's, I'm going to borrow Rick's hat in a minute and we'll talk about the brim. Rick, can I borrow your hat for a second? And in, a, in after, in a few minutes after I get through a few pictures, but I want to talk about that. Thank you. Okay, so if you'll keep going. Forgot to bring a hat today. So the next picture shows that the platter's been made, the angle has been made. This is actually the shape of the brim. And then the next picture shows that how it fits with the hat on top of it. Make a great top hat. You can see the little 16th inch accent at the bottom of it. And so that was wonderful. I wanted to leave it that way, but that's not the design of the soldier hat. So the next scary thing was to mark it and go to the bandsaw to cut around to make the brim. It's a lot of scary things making a nutcracker. You make this beautiful part and then you have to cut it apart. It's not the fun part. So I'm getting more proficient with the bandsaw though. So this is cut and then the next picture it shows it's been cut all the way around. After cutting it, the easiest way to sand it is on the disc sander to cut or to sand around the outside because it has to be at a point where I don't know if you can tell the disc sander that lip has to be sanded flush all the way around when you look at the hat, you can see that so the next and then this would be the finished hat so. Later on, it will be drilled just like the other hat for dowels, which is in the next picture. So this one will probably only need one dowel because it's shallower than the crown. So we'll stop there and I have borrowed Rick's hat. So the brim of the soldier is just like this brim. That's why it had to be cut so that it fits this angle for the hat. So thank you, Rick, for showing letting me borrow it because I just wanted to show how it's different than just the top hat. That's the brim that we want. So, oh, I forgot to pass this around. We just wanted to see your hairdo. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to be passing this around. So this is the top of the hat that is made in. This will be painted probably black. I'm still deciding, but the greens will show through the spray paint, which gives a nice pattern to the hat. Then the other part is the brim. And as you're looking at that, you can see how it's sanded up to that lip. And this will actually fit on side, right along the edge of it. There is a glue stop line in here so that the glue doesn't go far. And I'll include the cutoff part so you can just see. Um, how the whole parts would have fit together. So I will pass that around if you don't mind, Mark. That's the hat and I'd forgotten, but you saw the crown. This is the part I had turned down for the beads when it should have been wider. So you can see how and, and this would have been much too small for a crown, but it was a great size for just beads. So I'll use it for some other project and I'll just set that back here. So that's the soldier hat. We're actually getting close to most of the parts of a nutcracker. So there's a lot of pieces of a nutcracker and there's one wooden piece that's not turned and that's the jaw. So the jaw is has its own challenges as far as how it's handled. If you'll go ahead to the pictures, I'll talk through them and then we'll bring out the jaws. And if you ever make a nutcracker, I suppose this video helps at least know what the big, we didn't have the big picture when we were in the class. We're gonna make this and then we're going to make this. And it, until it was constructed, it was hard to see what things needed to be tweaked or, or sized correctly. So when Paul gives you the kit, when as part of the class, he has already somewhat cut the jaws out. And these are three of the jaws, three of us, 
posed for a picture, but he's also traced what should be the shape. So if you look at the pencil line on the outside, that's the general shape of the jaw. At, we have to smooth that out. So the next thing we would do is go to the bandsaw and just it, meticulously cut on those lines so that we have our shape for putting it into the nutcracker. The outside can be sanded with a, with a disc sander, but the inside is best done with, a, is that a band sander? Band, is that band sander, right? I think, band saw. It, belt sander. I knew there was a word I was missing. So this is the belt sander. And that's the easiest way to get inside the inside of the jaws. Uh, from there, we have to actually go back to the torso because we have to fit that jaw into the into it correctly. So you have to pick what are the sides of your torso and mark down just a little bit from the shoulder where you're going to place your arms. So this is the mark that will be drilled for the arm placement of the dowels. So then we went to the drill press and with a, forget the size, three eighth inch, I think these are three eighth inch dowels. Five oh, these are five sixteenths. Okay, these are five sixteenths inch dowels. So these, this is drilled into the side of the torso on both sides at a, a little bit under the shoulder. Then we change the drill bit to fit what will later be a pivot pin for the jaw. So this actually is drilled down the center of the hole that we just drilled on the left side and only on the left side of the nutcracker at this point. So it's just part way through. Then we have a short nail that we put in to test and mark the placement of where this jaw will go. And you can kind of see it and you'll see in the next picture, but there's a line at the top that traces the angles of the torso itself. So we have the shape of the torso. And then in the next picture, it shows the lines that were drawn. That blue arrow is pointing to where the teeth will go on, on the nutcracker. So these are the teeth for the jaw. Then underneath where it's cut inward, that's where the beard will go. Then the hemisphere at the top is like the cup to put the nut in. If you have a nutcracker, you're allowed to put nuts in, which at our house isn't so much. Um, and then the hole is where the nail marked where the pivot pin will go. So now it's back to the bandsaw to cut the angles. The teeth are the teeth decal are exactly one quarter inch width. So that has to be exactly cut. So we're cutting these shapes. And then there, we have to sand the, the little cup that would be for the nut. So there's always a question, can we do something in a better way? So Ken decided to try a Forstner bit to cut down there. However, it didn't cut all the way smoothly. It turned out that the bandsaw actually worked a little bit better, but we don't know until we try it. So that part is cut out and then but sanding that particular portion was difficult until he found a little drum sander, really small drum that we could put on the drill press. And then it made sanding a lot easier. After everything has been sanded, then it was time to test it, make sure it's right. And once everything fits correctly, we put shims on one side so it's tight against the other side of the torso. And then to drill all the way through the left side, through the jaw, and part way into the right side. You don't go all the way across, but that's the area that the pivot pin will be put. So that's drilled. And then we tested it. We were hoping and put this nail part way in to check it and everything lined up. We don't put it in permanently at this point. Once the pivot pin is put in, it's one of the last steps in putting the nutcracker together. It goes in and then the, the 
the dowel for the for the arm fits on top of it. Ken was noticing on the commercial one, they didn't do that. They just kind of put it in between. It's not as cleanly done. So the next thing is, oh, there's a place for the teeth. This is a little hard to imagine. Um, if, if I don't have a head handy, but with the, I'll pretend that this is what I want. So if I have the torso and it has a slot cut out, and this will pretend is my head, this is an inexpensive way to sand the teeth so that they're going to fit in the top of the head of the nutcracker. So a paint stick with two kind of grits of sandpaper helps to sand those. And on the head that went around, I don't know if any of you noticed, but there was a place for the teeth. If I'll bring this up. So on the jaw, the part that we cut is this part that has to fit the teeth. And then there's also a spot at the top for the teeth. And that's the part that's sand, sanded out at that angle. So there's so many processes. <laughs> so at this point, the last thing that would be happening is getting ready to construct the nutcracker. We have all the pieces. It would be time to drill for leg placement, drill for some of those kinds of things. And I'm not gonna use any other pictures of the drilling that I've kind of talked through that. At this point, it's Thursday, late Thursday. The class goes until Friday. We have all the parts finally made. We've masked the areas that aren't to be painted on the legs, like the dowels. Those are going to be glued. You have to put mask. You have to mask those. And then it's off to the spray paint booth to paint the legs, to paint the different parts. So the only parts that are painted on these two on the soldier are the hat and the legs and the shoes are hand painted and on the king the crown and the the um, shoes are hand painted so the crown and the dome we learned paul paul uses um that calf cryo 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 paints but we learned that on this particular project it's an art piece you want to do a nice job you should not use a primer plus paint as one because otherwise it was kind of peeling off i think wasn't it it dripped and paul had to redo your whole dome yes so a sandable primer works better and then ken and i were shopping since we're currently making some nutcrackers and we found that for the most part, Krylon makes a primer paint mix, except we were able to find some little multicolor Krylon shortcuts, which will work really well on small projects. These are the only ones that we could find that were multicolor that did not have a primer in it. So we have a few things that will be painted on our new ones. Otherwise, Thursday afternoon was the paint booth. On Friday, we put the decals on and we had to have everything done by about one o'clock for a picture. What? Friday oh. also hair and beard. Oh yes, hair and beard. Okay, yes. So on Friday, it was a rush to do the rest of it. <clears throat> on the king, these can only be glued two at a time and it's with a 30 minute epoxy so they don't come off. So you sit there and you do something else for a while. So those take a while to drill. The mink had to be stretched in a certain way for the hair. And Paul said that that actually holds up best. So that's what he uses. So, and this one had a belt and we had to learn how to put the decals on. Debbie, Paul's wife taught us how to do that. Then on the soldier, Ken had a great time and I can't wait to do this part. Uh, putting these little, these are just brads, aren't they? Yeah. These little brads in place to put the on the decoration for the soldier. Later on, we made the swords. Later on, we made the scepters, some of those kinds of things. But 
we ran out of time to make them in class so he quickly showed us at the end we were barely making it out by five o'clock on friday with completed nutcrackers it's an intense project we learned a lot and at i mean it's the most most complicated project i've ever made i would like ken to come up and you've looked at all the parts i'm going to have him just put his together he has all the parts here and he'll just show you how it goes together when we're actually putting it together it like i said it was a wood turning class so everything was um focused on the wood turning portion when i first signed up for the nutcracker class somebody asked me well are you going to do any wood turning there because most of the time you think wood turning is a bowl or a vase or some of those kinds of things and 13 pieces of wood turning during a week definitely was a wood turning class i felt like i had adequate skills but there were some things that kirk to here helped me with and paul helped me with that i was really grateful for i don't think i have the pin no i didn't grab the pin okay let me go grab the crown okay i can get it okay mark yeah please so we have drilled for the um for all of the tenons and we okay we need the crown I forgot to grab the pin to put the do you have enough room so it won't fall off? <laughs> Nothing's glued right now. I forgot to grab a pin. Jaw has to go in here and a pin goes through the left arm and then it's permanently in there, so you've got a pivot point. I don't know. Can you hear him? So the okay. The left arm disappears because you put it in with the arm covering. Place. Yes. Yes. The question was if the pivot pin disappears, and it does because the arm will be covering it. Yes, because this will be in place. What do you need? Uh oh. He was awake the whole time. <laughs> Bob was too, he was just pretending. So, so this is cool. So, wood parts. So, at the moment, he and I are in the middle of finishing it. We have the word wood parts so that I could do the demo today. So, by next month for show and tell, we'll have them completed so that you can see the final product. But I want to thank the club for giving me the scholarship, awarding it to me so that I could learn something beyond my abilities in many ways. It, there was so much to learn. And I was grateful Ken went with me. At first, when I asked him, I told him I was taking a nutcracker class. I wasn't sure he wanted to go with me. Mark. And so I invited him to sit in the hotel, but that didn't seem very plausible. I initially had no interest in doing a nutcracker, but I thought, well, there's probably a little bit more than just wood turning. So when she comes back and wants to do this again, I'm probably going to be helping her in the shop. Well, yes, I have been. <laughs> and I'm very glad I went to the class because there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. And it's almost all spindle turning most of it is except for the crown but there's 13 turned parts here and there's large parts there's small parts and there's a lot of shop work actually that goes along with this whole process if i had not gone to the class with her we would even though he she had instructions we would never have been able to put it all together so i'm very thankful that i did go and it's a very interesting and difficult project. It's probably the most difficult wood turning project I have done. This is harder for me than the uh, segmented wood turnings that I've done in the past. There's more complexity to this and a lot more 
precision parts that I hadn't had to do with most of my other wood turns. So I encourage everybody to try it sometime. No, 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 no. no. Uh, in fact, the soldier hat is actually ash. Oh, the body right, is ash. ash. The yes, and he Paul Anderson specifically chose some of these woods for for specific reasons. He pointed out that he wants ash for the soldier hat because he likes to see the grain that comes through the paint. The legs for the soldier are painted. So what's under there is he called several of these pieces paint grade maple, paint grade poplar, other items. If you're going to paint it, you don't see the grain. But where it's being shown, he matched like the torso and the arms and the head, I believe are all ash, specifically to get the grain the pattern. Is, the head is not, it's it's maple. 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 Yeah, the question is, did we buy these kits? Yes. When we finished the class, we knew Kathy was going to have to do this demo. And we knew that I had turned a soldier, she had turned a king, and we wanted to reverse that process so that I would do a king, she would do a soldier, so we'd know how to do both of them. So at the end of the class, we bought two kits. And then because, again, because of the demo, she thought, I may need one more. So we bought three extra kits that we brought home with us. It, it's, it's not an inexpensive project. It's about, it's about $135 for the kit plus shipping if you were to buy it here, uh, which I think is reasonable because the pieces are pre-cut. But, it, and it does include the, some of the it includes the fur and the, the some, fur and the vinyl things the problem is trying to find some of the large pieces of wood uh there was another member in our class who had taken it it was his second time he'd gone home from the first class and and he wanted to collect uh, wanted to make more he told us that he had to buy very large lot quantities of some of these woods to get the size and type of wood that he was after for the kit. So in my mind, it's actually cheaper to buy the kit. You already have the right woods and the right sizes. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting project to make. I'm not sure that everyone would want to make one, but I advise if you ever do that you either take Paul's class or work with someone who has made them before. It's more than the dimensions. Dennis has a question. None of mine. Of the Allen's <laughs> nutcrackers? The question Zero. is how many have cracked a nut? No. Uh, they're not going to happen for a long time. I'm uh, still amazed I made it. <laughs> Pete, do you have a question? I, oh, the question about the gauges, how they were made. Actually, Kirk Deheer had them made for us while we were there because we were so busy making things. He was trying to be ahead of the processes, so he handed them to us. We didn't make them. Yes, question. Yeah, I'm afraid he's gonna knock it over too. He's he's a little too close. Um, question, Dean. I'd like to commend you for an excellent demonstration. Um, Thank you. But, and also uh, I'm curious as to how you two work in the shop together and not get divorced. <laughs> He, he has learned how to be really patient with me. It's it's an exercise in patience. She's on her lathe, I'm on mine. <laughs> we, each, actually, we each have our own lathe. There's, as I said, there's a lot of workshop additional things she had no experience with. So I've been mentoring her on how to do woodworking in addition to she's she's got the wood turning part down, but She's a much better woodworker today than she was two months ago. Come a long way, Kathleen. Thank you. I even get, I even get, 
an interesting thing since this is Ed Jones scholarship is Ed was the very first one in my whole life who let me use a table saw. I was making a segmented form at his last class that he taught, and he was the only one who'd ever let me touch one. So that was pretty amazing. But now I'm a lot, I bought him a stop saw or saw stop, whichever it is. And so now I'm allowed to use one at home too. So she's had a little more training. <laughs> but yes, Ed, I would never allow her to touch this, the table saw or the band saw because she'd never had experience with them. So I grew up in the epic where once, girls didn't get to do shop. Once Ed uh, changed that, uh, I'd relaxed that uh, attitude and I'm glad to be teaching her some of these other skills. Well, just for yours, SawStop is all well and good for the touch technology. It still has kickback. And yes. That's we, very, we, very, very, we very important. Know. So it's still a saw. It's it's still still a saw. saw. Care what you Kathy, I want to thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, it's probably one of the thoroughest, and I've watched hundreds of YouTube. You had, did an excellent job in explaining everything and step by step. And this is something that goes right along with what you do. And Chuck does with the beading stuff, never going to happen. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, it's, it's way out of my patience level but thank you so much thank any you. other questions oh come on guys this was way too complicated. well you said i was thorough maybe they don't <laughs> no I, I i commend you highly on thank what you, you did the presentation breaking everything down showing each step that took a lot i can't wait for tuesday to see how you're going to top this so. but thank you very much <laughs> thank you and it was give her another big hand it's, Thank you. I want you all to take note so when you do presentations, you can be as thorough as she is. Yeah. <laughs>